Hey, we're beginning a series today, eight weeks on the one another's. It's building healthy relationships, and that applies here at the church as well as your sports team, schools, uh, work environment, at home, however that is. And uh, we're a family, and as a family, again, whether it's a sports team, as a family, as everyone's together, there's like rules. There's like ways in which you're supposed to function in order to have really healthy relationships. And that's what we're going to talk about for the eight weeks or so. During COVID, during the height of it in 2020, when things were really starting to shut down, uh, we took it upon ourselves to think this is a really good time to travel. And we did a lot of motorcycling during, uh, during COVID. It was just like perfect because roads were empty and we could stop at a restaurant, but just, just eat outside, which is cool anyway, right? That's what you're supposed to do on a bike. And so... Our son Ross and I, he would have been 18 at the time, and so, uh, so we would ride, we were riding everywhere. I mean, we were Utah, Colorado. There was one time, and it was a local ride, we were on the other side of Phoenix, which is Scottsdale. We were cutting through Scottsdale and heading to a little town called Fountain Hills. And as we were riding, we're kind of in f- formation, and I looked over, and this was right when businesses were starting to open. And there was this massive banner like somebody thought this was a good idea in front of a church. In front of the church was this massive banner that said, Christianity is now reopened. I'm right. I looked at that. I looked over at Ross and pointed, and I saw he was funny. He's, he's full covered. I've got like the half shell. He's got the full cover. But I see his head go, like, really? I didn't know it was closed. It wasn't closed, right? Christianity wasn't closed down. In fact, as we look back, there were really some decent things that happened. That Easter, we were not meeting. We were normally 2,000 on a Sunday at that time, at that church. We would have had 3,000 that Sunday morning. That's just kind of 50% more. That's the way it usually was. We were shut down. We had 4,000 online. We just did the math afterwards and went, hey, wait a second. For the weeks following, we were averaging 400 more estimated, more online viewing than we even had in the building. It shook us. It changed a huge amount of your business, right? Your school. It changed a whole lot of things. But Christianity was never shut down. But then we came out of it realizing there is a a special feature to us physically being in the room together. I remember Alistair Begg, they're out of Cleveland, which many of us love, right? We love Alistair Begg. And I remember coming out of all of it eventually, six months later or so, he said, we're not even posting online anymore because it's not the same as meeting physically. We became enabling people to not join together as a family. There is a uniqueness to joining together as a family that you cannot get on television. You can't get just streaming. This is different. Oh, you could stream this. We can get a better preacher. I'm pretty sure of that. That's not the goal. The value of this setting is not what we're doing up here. The value is you. It's the family. It's us joining together around a central cause. And as we join together, there's like, there's like rules, boundaries. There's a purpose in mind which means that we could show up on a Sunday morning, we can go through a bit of a routine and leave and miss the target. Happens maybe more than we know. Well, that means we need to know what the target is. Why are we coming together? Why is it that we join physically together as a body? It's so important for us. Remember, as a family, we were in the Blue Mosque, it's called, in Istanbul, and it's just, this facility is hard to imagine its size, its, its beauty. 
and they kneel, so there's no chairs, there's nothing. It's just this big, massive room that would hold thousands and thousands of people. But there's a rule. Not just at the Blue Mosque, but there's a rule in mosques. When you gather together, if there were possibly only 100 people on that particular day in that particular meeting, the rule is you have to be touching shoulders. Isn't that interesting? So pause for a minute and think, okay, there's no magic in that, but why would that be? And we're so different than that. We're so much, and I say we, all of us, and I'm going to think it's our culture overall, we're so individual that we want space, and we come in, and it's very us-minded. It's I'm going for my reasons, for me and my family, and I am so individual. That's how we could do it online and not miss a beat. It's about me anyway. But that message in Islam was that idea that, no, no, touch shoulders. If there's this massive room and there's 15 of you, you better be touching because it's about the group. We're a whole. We're together. So there are rules, and there's boundaries. There's a target in mind that we literally can say, after this Sunday, did I hit the target? Individually, leaving, walking out to a car, did I hit the target? That's what we're going to talk about, eight weeks, and it's eight weeks, eight targets that build healthy relationship within a community. There is a, um, uh, whenever I hear rules, if you just say the word rules to me, I think of Barney Fife. And you want to hear an impersonation? I have a Barney Fife impersonation. Of course I do. It's, do you guys know the episode? Here at the Rock. No? Anyone know that? Does that mean anything when I say here at the Rock? Is that the best? Okay, you could hear my impersonation if you want, or you could hear Barney do it. Would you rather hear Barney? Is there any chance we can get Barney up there? Now, men, there are a few things we ought to get straightened out right at the start to avoid any grief later on. Now here at The Rock, we have two basic rules. Memorize them so that you can say them in your sleep. The first rule is, obey all rules. (laughs) Secondly, do not write on the walls as it takes a lot of work to erase writing off of the wall. There you go. How does Andy and Gomer, how do they possibly see that Andy with his head down thinking, oh, this is so funny. Here at The Rock, we have two rules. <clears throat> we mention that as a family all the time. If anyone says, are there any rules? And somebody say, well, I can think of two rules. Well, we have rules here. We join together and we actually have a set of things in which we do. And if you have notes in front of you or however you're following along or if you grab a piece of paper or something, they're titled one another's. That's what the rules are. They're one another's. It's an easy study. You could just go and search for the phrase one another in the New Testament and you'll come up with about 34. I know, it makes you appreciate the two rules of Barney, 34 one another's in the New Testament. It's a fascinating little look if you pull them all together and you look at them and you'll read each one and you go, oh yeah, that's a good idea. In fact, there's 12 negative and 22 positive one another's. The negatives are, one another don't do this. One another don't be like this. But more positive, 22, you need to be like this. I'll tell you, if you could pull the Bible verses out of it, drop all the these and thous, they would be a great little list of things for a sports team. You read them. If you read them and didn't know, 
that they were Bible one another's for a church body, you would say, oh, if I could only get a team like that. If my work team was like this, how much more productive and healthy would the relationships be? They're one another's. Okay, you Bible scholars in the room, online, can you think of any one another's? Any, possi- any possibility that a Bible text came to your mind when we say one another, what are some that you remember you can already think of that are in the New Testament? Something one another. What is it? Love one another. What is it? Abide. Give. Forgive one another. Yeah, everyone, I said give, and everyone's like, no, 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 that's not one. No, 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 I'd rather forgive than give. <laughs> like, whew, that could have cost me. Can anyone think of another one? Pray. Be kind. Yep. So you, can, you, you know them. That's what's so fun about this is that we look through, and we're just going to cover eight of them, but as you look through them, they look familiar, and you're like, oh, I know that passage. So in your own Bible, you could take and you can kind of circle through and you can highlight there's 34 of them. Even the ones that we just said, uh, abide, not give, but forgive, be kind. You think of some of these, and you're like, yeah, a sport, sports team. These would be good if we all followed these. But as a church, they form healthy boundaries for us or guidelines that prescribe how it is we're to be treating one another. When practiced, these ideas, negative and positive, come together, and we're good at it, they make some pretty good living. Let me frame it for you, though. Jesus was asked in Matthew uh, 22, what's the greatest commandment? And he said, uh, love one another. Well, already he surprised them because there were over 600 official commandments, and so there wasn't a better one, and so they were tricking him. They expected probably to be answered with a question, right, so that he could get out of that, and he puts it back on them. He's very clever like that, but he didn't. He said, well, what's the greatest of the commandment out of all of them? <laughs> and he goes, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind. And they're like, oh. And then he goes, oh, and, you know, you didn't ask, but the second one? I'll give you the second one, too. <laughs> love each other. And they're like, oh, didn't expect that. So think for a minute as a command. Love God, a healthy, submissive, honoring, reverent relationship with God. Think of that for a minute of yourself. Did your day start that way? Faith in Jesus Christ gives us a relationship with Him. And so we live in that reverence of Him. We love God. Remember Augustine's old quote? That, he goes, this is all of life. Love God and then do as you please. Because if you love God, truly love God with all your heart, soul, and mind, it likes all the veins open up. Everything's clean and clear. Everything starts to clean out. Life is balanced. Life has a target. It's so clean. That's how we're created is love God. But then as we love God, <clears throat> I think it's kind of like the snapping us out of it. I just want to, I'm just going to live my life loving God. Well, yeah, sure, that would be really nice to ignore everybody in the world and all the needs of my neighbors and my friends and my coworkers and my teammates. Yeah, I'd love to do that too, but that's not what we were called to do. Just love God. No, love God, and as we love Him, His heart becomes our heart. We start to think like Him. We start to value things He values. 
And so he goes, and I'll give you a tip. Love God, and then love others as yourself. Oh, so once I love, I then put my effort and energy into loving others. There's the core of it. You want a target for your day, that's it. How do I know I've successfully lived a good day? You and I will typically say, well, I was at every class on time, or I was at work on time, or time-ish, and I got some things done, and they thought I was online all day, so that was good, um, because, you know, the mouse moves. And so I succeeded, and no, wait, what's a successful day? Made a big contract today. That's success. Yeah, that is success. Lower value, but it is a success. Being on time is a good idea, so success. Is that what our day's target is? Hmm. In school, it was the fact that I went. That was success. I don't know, I had, I had parents that would just let me anytime I want, I, and this is horrible to say for any student that's in the room, I could just put a sign on my bedroom door that said, woe is me. That's what I always wrote, woe is me. I'm woe, okay? And if that's on the door, they got up, I got up before them, they got up and they walked by the door and that sign was on the door, it meant, just leave me and let me sleep, please. And they were like, yeah, whatever. And so I was actually able to do that. Isn't that amazing? I would skip school. This is a bad topic. I would skip sco- high school. My grandparents lived a block from the high school. So I would figure out a way to get out of school, and I'd always go, because I loved my grandma and grandpa, and I would go and hang out with them. And my grandma, I can still remember, I'll open the door, and she'd go, Robbie, how did you get out of school today? She was so proud. I said, I gave blood three times. And she goes, you get a snack. And so I would use maybe the blood pass and get out of all the classes just from the one pass. I'd only give once. Yeah, maybe I didn't actually give. What's success? Here it is. You could ask it at the end of the day. Did my day today resemble loving God and loving people? That's success. So you broke down and you didn't even get to work. It was that bad. Well, I'm glad that wasn't the target because that's out of your hands. Winning the game was actually out of your hands. Did the best you could. That's not the target. The target is love God, love others. So we literally put our head on the pillow and say, did I make it? Did I express and show love to people today out of my love and devotion for God? That's an easy target. That's literally a little phrase to look at our day, did we do it or not? Under the category of loving one another, he has a structure. He has like lines that come out, categories to say, let me help you. Let me, let me help you do that, because it's a little abstract. I'm going to love everybody. Okay, let me give you an idea. So some of them might be on the negative. Don't provoke anybody. Don't envy one another. Don't lie. Don't grumble. Don't judge one another. Ooh. Oh, you mean really love people then. Like you're giving me ways in which. Those are the negative not to do. The positive, there's, there's 22 of them. Be devoted to one another. Edify. Did you leave that meeting? Were they built up or were they torn down? Instruct, care, serve. I love this one. Bear one another. Bear with them. Encourage. Pray. So if you imagine a school classroom or a team, if they had this as a target, of course they want to win. They're a team. 
Yeah, but we win within this environment of care. So Romans 12 says that we are a family one of another. So if you take a look with me in Romans chapter 12, take a look to this one passage. Romans 12 Verse 3 says, For a grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think of yourself more highly than you ought, but think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. For as in one body we have many members, and the members do not have all the same function. So we, though many, are one body in Christ, members one of another. So first of all, the category in which we're framing this is that we are to have these one another's in this love, and there's the spirit of humility. We walk in in a spirit of humility. We join together. We walk into the workroom. We walk into the lunchroom. We have a family meeting. We're meeting as a community in a room. It's not about ourselves. It's this humility that we're actually joining together with by grace given to me, not to think of himself more highly than he ought. There's a humility. Here's another piece of this as a family. We learned this years ago. Just talked to somebody about it this week. Is as a family, again, think sports team. You can think your family. You can think of a work environment. And definitely, maybe most of all, a church family together. To break down the individualism and realize that we're interdependent. It was many years ago, right as Grant was facing his disabilities at age seven, the onset of the eye disease, and eight, nine, and then junior high officially being legally blind and seeing it progress. Through that process, I was thinking, I need to teach him how to be independent, right? I mean, I don't want him to be dependent on, and so I'm going to do everything I can. So think of your own kids, disabilities all the more so, but your child, anybody, you want to teach an independence, so I thought. I was sitting with a staff member of mine, a little older and wiser, and he said, he goes, oh, yeah, I used to think that too. I said, I realize the goal is to teach interdependence. I said, really? He goes, yeah, independence is not good. Dependence is not good. You want to teach this area of interdependence. We need to teach our kids when it's time to ask for help. Don't ask for help when you can do it yourself, but ask for help when you need help and accept it. There's a humility of assessing our situation to live interdependent. And that as a church body, if we could learn to come in and not, I don't need any of you, if we're at the place in life where we say, I don't need any of you, we're at a bad place. We're never going to excel to the point in which God wants us to be because we're doing it solo. Instead, we're interdependent. Uh, Dave and I were talking about this, Hapchuk and I, last night in the truck. We we're saying that we need one another. Everyone has some strength to bring to the table, and we find that strength, and we tap into it, and we give them our strength. So here's Grant now, 27 years old, and some irony this last few weeks. He's, he finished his second master's degree in order to gain certification to teach special needs. So he teaches blind kids. And so here's some irony. He's through the Arizona Department of Education. He is setting up to take the test. He is on emergency certification, right? Teachers know what that is. And he's getting his certification for special needs they wouldn't give him any special accommodations to take the test. So he calls and tells me that, and I'm like, huh? So Arizona Department of Education is not going to give you accommodation to take a 
special needs test and you can't see. He goes, yeah, they're fighting me. And I'm like, this is impossible. This is almost funny, right? I mean, it's like, this is a joke. This is ironic. Finally, they gave in. So they gave in, and they're allowing him to have a proctor who can help him. He's got to write essays. He's doing the whole thing in Braille. Needs more time. That's the biggest thing for all of us in the room who have read Braille, right? It takes forever. So they finally give him the accommodation. Is this a long story? It is. It's getting a little longer. He shows up three weeks ago to the test, middle of spring break, bad timing, whatever. The proctor's an hour and a half late. It's a six-hour test. The proctor's an hour and a half late. Okay, that's not good. He gets through the whole thing. He feels good about it, turns it in, just gets notified last week that they're not accepting it because the proctor didn't process it correctly. Grant, I think I saw this, this Casey this week, it, Grant is like Charlie Brown when Lucy pulls the football away. Do we all know what that means? That's Grant. His spirit, his attitude, great kid. He wants, just wants to cook, kick the football, that's all. And I said, so what are you going to do? He goes, they have to reschedule, I have to retake the test. Okay, dad, right? I'm like, I'm going to the Arizona Department of Education myself. This is interdependence. This is it. He's got to take care of it himself. How does a parent defend their child but not interfere? I don't want to do it for, can't do it for him. A, a spouse would do it for another spouse. No, he has to do it. Who contacted the lawyer? Well, I did. He's a friend. He's a good friend. Got great advice. Explained what can be done to make this better. But not too much. What's Grant going to do about it? My guess is that he is going to retake the test and no one will even know that any of it happened. And I'm like, and I told him last night again on the phone, bud, you realize I just gave you the options. It's completely up to you, and I'm so proud of you at whichever path you choose. I will help you do whatever path you want to do. Do you see interdependence? It's that balance. You and I are living a Christian life in a world that is not Christian, 100% not Christian, pagan, from advertisements to television, it's all pagan. All the news, yes, even your Fox News, it's all pagan. Pagan, it's non-Christian. Christ is not in it. That's what we face. You and I cannot live for the cause of Jesus Christ, which is living in a love relationship with him to love others and as a church, glorify God to see many people come to know Christ. You and I cannot, should not ever do that alone. It's impossible. You say, well, I can. No, you shouldn't. As great as you are, I know how to make you better. It's work together as a team. We are created to be one another. You take a teammate on a sports team, your basketball team, that it's all about them, you know that's, that's like one mark against the team. That best player on the team has the attitude of, oh, it's about us as a team, and I hope I make everybody better, and they mean it because it's one another. It's interdependent. If you can live just fine without coming to fellowship of other believers week after week after week, you're living an independent Christian life, and you are settling for what's not best for you. I promise you that. What's best is that we are interdependent upon one another, and as the greatest strengths as you may have, you offer those to people around you, and you find these around you with these streaks of genius in particular areas that you actually need. Makes you better. It's interdependent. And that's what we're called to. And it plays itself out. 
in which the family dynamic in this room all of a sudden becomes where we are properly fulfilling the cause of Christ that he has called us to. I said it again. In fact, Dave, last night, sitting with those guys at that event, we said it again to these guys who I'm guessing are non-churchgoers, maybe? I don't know. Maybe so. That, yes. And, um, and I admitted to them. I said, the truth is, if you eliminated our church from the community, there's a good chance the community would not even know it. And we're sitting at an event, a fundraiser of a group of people that are making a big difference in the community. And that's humbling. Maybe embarrassing. We love God. We love others in this way of all these one another's, humble in interdependence, so that we can together make a difference in our community. And we're all individually doing it, and I think it's amazing. You guys volunteer at different nonprofit organizations, and you're doing great things. You're giving, and you're generous, and that's good. Could you imagine if we coordinated all the more and grew individually and then grew and be more effective in the community in which we live? So that's the series. It's seven weeks going forward on house rules. And do you have, do you have house rules in, at your house? Does anyone have any house rules posted? Just curious. Anybody? Anybody? Oh, yeah, it's every man for himself, right? That's Okay, so I did find a couple. Let, let me look at a couple of these. Uh, this would have been a good one to have at a house. If you sleep on it, make it up. If you step on it, wipe it up. If you wear it, hang it up. Oh, yeah, our daughter, she'll try it on, and rather than hang it up, we know what you girls do. You throw it in the hamper because it's amazing. It gets cleaned, refolded, and hung. Oh, is that how that works? Sarah's like, yeah, I thought that was a lot of outfits today. Uh, if you drop it, pick it up. If you eat out of it, wash it up. If it rings, answer it. I love the last one. If it howls, feed it. Okay, they get a little bit more serious on this one. A uh, House rules. The wife is always right. If the wife is wrong, see rule number one. That has got Barney Fife written all over it right there. Here at the house, we have two rules. Rule number one, the wife is always right. Okay, this is the last one. Remember, as far as anyone knows, we are a nice, normal family. Is that not it? I think of that on Sunday morning, pulling up, and we're all yelling at each other in the car, and then as soon as that door opens, morning, morning. That is great. Kids are behind going, this isn't true. This isn't true. None of this is true. We're a horrible group of people. Trust me. <laughs> we have an amazing days here at the church ahead. We really have getting tastes of it. Looking into just the last few weeks, some great contacts to bring on somebody to help with worship, whether it's part-time or how to do that, to bring us up to helping them engage. I'm telling you, you guys do a great job up front. You're hanging in there for us. You're doing a terrific job. We need somebody to come in to help lead it. A youth ministry. We've got fun things coming up in this summer. It's exciting. But as we do all of it, the target isn't let's accomplish events. The target isn't staffing. The target is love God and we love one another according to this structure. And that's what we're going to be dealing with in the days ahead. So let me pray for us. Heavenly Father, thank you for the privilege of us being together. We love you. And we're grateful for our relationship with you through Jesus. We commit these days ahead to you, and we commit them to one another as we continually grow in reaching this community for Jesus. And it's in his name we pray. Amen.